me, Ms. Lovely. I will introduce our speaker today. First, we have Mr. Nurus Zaman Faruqi, a senior lecturer from Bafodil International University. He will explain about basic concept of deep learning single layer ne neural network. Yeah, and I hope this event will be enjoyable and worthy of knowledge. Before we start for this class today, I would love us to pray first according to your own religion and belief. So everyone, let's pray start together. Yeah, thank you, Pray Finis. Yeah, for the session today, we will listen presentation from special lecture from Dapodil International University, Mr. Nurus Zaman Farukui, and then continue with the and session and then say take a picture together for documentation and closing. Maybe for Mr. Naru Zaman, you can start for this session today. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the floor. I think that this is the month of Ramadan and we should not waste more time in talking, but start the lecture. Please allow me some time while I uh, prepare the lecture slides on the screen and share it. Before starting, please let me know if you can see the presentation as presentation on the screen. Thank you for the response. I'm Nur Zaman Faruqi. You have already heard that. I'm a senior lecturer of the Department of Software Engineering of Daffodil International University. Daffodil International University is the top ranked university of Bangladesh. And this is the best university to study software engineering in this country. This is also one of the fastest ranking university in South Asia. So instead of talking about me and university, let's start our today's topic. And that is basic concept of deep learning, single layer neural network. Uh, the title has been prepared to draw the attention because those who of you are already expert in this field will think that deep learning requires multi-layer neural network. Why we are studying single-layer neural network as the building blocks. The reason behind it, that the concept of multi-layer neural network was derived from single-layer neural network and the challenge the single-layer neural network imposed. From that context, this is the building blocks. So moving on. All right, I'm looking for the annotation tools, but looks like the annotations tools are not activated. Okay, please wait, uh, please allow me some time till I can figure out where are the annotation tools. All right, the annotation tools are not available. Looks like I have to use the PowerPoint pointer then. That would be enough, no worries. So I believe that you are all familiar with the basic machine learning model. In the basic machine learning model, we have the training data. That training data is used to train a model. How do we train it? We train it with the machine learning algorithm. Once it is trained, then we use some real world data. It enters the model and we test the model, we get the output. The neural network is a type of machine learning algorithm. Here, the only difference is, instead of calling the model, we call it the neural network. And instead of just saying some learning rules, just say machine learning algorithms, we call it the learning rule. That means the rules we use to train the neural network. So we will start with the 
neural network first. We will get some idea about what is neural network, how to work with it. Then we will focus on the rest of the topic. A neural network is consisted of nodes and weights. This is a node and these are the associated weights with it. Although neural network can do very complicated calculation, as a matter of fact, it has become the state of art machine learning algorithm, but the calculation is pretty simple. The calculation is like this. It's nothing but weighted sum. The signal enters through the weights and they go to the node. The node calculates the weighted sum. The weight and the sum is multiplied and then it is added with other weight and sum multiplication. And finally, it generates a weighted sum. So instead of writing this verge equation, we can express it in terms of matrix, where W is a matrix of weight and S is a matrix of the signal. So this simple equation powers up the neural network. But there is one more thing with that. That is called the activation function. Once this weight, this weighted sum is calculated, that is sent to the activation function. The activation function processes the weighted sum and gives us the probability. Based on that probability, we make a decision. Depending on how many layers are there, how the layers are organized, we, can, we come up with different type of neural network. So what do we call a layer? We have already understood what are the nodes. These are the nodes. And a layer is consisted of those nodes. The first layer is called the input layer. The final layer is called the output layer. And the layers in between input and output are called the hidden layers. So input layer, output layer, and the hidden layers together form the neural network. Now, how their orientation creates the variations, we are going to have a look at that. When there is no hidden layer, we call it single layer neural network. When there is only one hidden layer, we call it a shallow neural network or a vanilla neural network. And when there is more than one hidden layers, we call it a multi-hidden layer neural network or the deep neural network. So now we know what is node, what is layer, how the orientation and number of layers form different type of neural network. We also know what is weighted sum, how the node calculates the weighted sum, and how the final output is processed through activation function. That means we are good to go to see how the signal flows. You have noticed that in neural network, there are multiple nodes, multiple layers. So how the signal goes through those layers and nodes, how these layers and nodes processes the signals. And that's what we're going to learn now. So we have an entire network here. S1 represents signal one, S2 represents signal two. S1 is entering through this input layer or input node. Input node performs nothing but passes the signals to the next immediate nodes. Same thing is happening for signal two. When they go to the node, they actually go through the weights associated with the nodes. 
and we have already seen that, how signal is multiplied with the nodes. After multiplication, it goes to the node. And once two signal enters in this node, it calculates the weighted sum, that is one value. That value is processed through activation function here, and then it generates the output. That output again goes to the goes to the next nodes by being multiplied with the weights, and again they're processed through the activation function. So repetition of the same process keeps happening over and over again as long as we have layers in the network. For your ease of understanding, I have already made a block diagram. You can see that input layer, hidden layer, activation function. Then again, the processed signal goes to the second hidden layer, then activation function. In this way, it crosses n hidden layers and activation functions. Finally, we get the output. So that's the flow of the signal through neural network. Now that previous one was based on block diagram without any value. Let's add some value as an example. This time, the value of signal one is two and signal two is four. The weight values are W1 equals six, W2 equals four, W3 equals three, and W4 equals eight. So the weight values are here, and these weight values are here. And for the sake of simplicity, we added one as bias to keep it simple. And to make it even simpler, we used linear activation function. That means literally, the activation function is not doing anything here. But that is not realistic in real world. We don't use linear activation function because it doesn't process anything. This is just for simplicity. Whenever we're learning something complicated, we must start with the simplest possible form. That's the best way of effective learning and we are following it in today's class. Now, at the beginning, the calculation may look a little complicated, but I tried my best to make it as simple as possible by omitting a half portion of the network. That means we are focusing only this part of the network. And let's do the calculation on this part, then we'll repeat the same calculation for the next part. In this first node, signals are entering through weight six and weight two. Observe carefully, six into two, two into four. So this two is being multiplied with six. This two is being multiplied with two. Oh, there is a spelling mistake here. It should be two. Uh, those side changes. I think you understand. So this multiplication is added and the weighted sum is calculated. The weighted sum is 21. Here it should be four. It's a little typing mistake. I think you understand. Now let's focus on this Second note. In the second note, the calculation is still the same. W2 is multiplied with S1, W4 is multiplied with S2. And the weighted sum is calculated, and that goes through the activation function. And finally, we get the value. Again, we use linear activation function. That's why nothing is changing. So instead of doing this calculation separately, when we, up, when we express it as matrix format, then the calculation becomes much more organized. 
and we express it as matrix so that we can write the code. At the end of the lecture, we will go to MATLAB and we will implement what we are learning. This matrix representation will be very helpful then. So here, the weight, I mean, here, the, this is the weight, this is the weight, this is the signal, this is the signal. I again ask for your apology. The signal was mistakenly put two here, it should be four. Uh, then again, the weight, the signal, the signal, the weight, and the weight. This is the bias, this is the bias, and this is the final calculation. So our final output will be 21 and 41. After correcting the weight mistake here, again, except my apology. All right, moving on. So these are the weights. Instead of using values, we are using placeholders here. So what does it mean? It means that weights of first node, and these are the weights of second node. This was the equation we started at the very beginning. That means the neural network works in a matrix format where the first row contains the weight of all of the first nodes. The second row contains the weight of all of the second nodes. And the last row contains the weight of all of the last nodes. We can view it in another way. First column contains the weights like weights of first, weight of first node, weight of second node, weight of third node in this way. So this is how this table is organized. This matrix is organized and we can see the signal matrix and the bias matrix. And this is what we are going to follow from now on. Now the rest of the part of the signal, of the network. This node has already processed the input signal and generated the output through activation function. Now this signal will go through this and this direction. So this six is here and this 10 is here. This four is here and this two is here. So we can see that the signal entering in this node is six and four, the first row. And the signal entering in this node is 10 and two the second row, exactly what we talked during the matrix representation. And the signal entering is 21, and another one is 41. The biases are one and one. If we do the calculation, then this is the output. Again, we're using linear activation function, so nothing changes here. So now we have seen what is a neural network, how it works, what is node, how the signal flows, and how it processes the signal. Now we should focus on the learning rule. Once we will understand the learning rule, then we will start training the network. So the, before starting uh, talking about learning rule, let, us, let me give you the big picture, how it actually works. In supervised learning, training data comes in, input and correct output pair. That means for one particular input, we already know what should be the correct output. And when this input signal enters into the network, as usual, the way I explained, they are processed and goes to the output. We already know what output we are expecting, this correct output. This correct output goes here. We subtract 
the predicted the our output or the predicted output and the correct output so this is the predicted output and this is the correct output if both are same that means there is no error if both are not same there is an error that means the machine or the neural network is not predicting what it is expected we use this error this error is used to adjust the weights associated with these nodes. It adjusts the weight. It adjusts the weight in such a way so that next time we give the signal, we give the input signal, it generates the corresponding expected output and the error reduces. And that's the overall learning process. It's the overall process of how neural network works. It's like any supervised learning approach. Now let's talk about the learning rule. Learning rule are like learning algorithms, how we are training, training algorithms, how we are training the neural network. The simplest learning rule is the delta rule. As I mentioned at the beginning, we will always start with the simplest possible approach. So we are starting with the simplest one. So what are the steps of this algorithm? First, declare the initial weights randomly. So these are our weights. We will declare them randomly. Definitely, we don't know which weight will work the best. So declare them randomly. After that, take the input data and pass them to the neural network. So this input signal will enter and we will generate an output that is Y. Now we have the output and we know the correct output. From that, we will calculate the error. The error E will be calculated and we need this error to find the delta value. So what is the delta value? The delta value is alpha. This is called the learning rule. Alpha is called the learning rule. With this learning, it's not learning rule, sorry, it's learning rate. With this learning rate, we control how fast or how slowly the network will learn. The range is from zero to 1.0. If it is zero, the network will not learn. If it is one, network will learn so rapidly, it will not converge to the solution. If it is say 0 0.001, the network will learn very slowly, but it will be very accurate. So we have to decide what learning rate we are going to use. So alpha, the learning rate. After that, we have E. Let me clean the monitor. It looks messy. Okay, raising this all those annotations so that we have a better look. Okay, wait for a minute. I'm loading the pointer. All right, we're good to go. So we have learned what is learning rate. After that, this error, this error is coming from here. And after that, the signal, the signal means this signal. So this delta is calculated by multiplying the learning rate, the error, and the input signal. Once the delta is calculated on a step six, step five, we add this delta with the existing weight. Then the weight changes and this changed or modified weight is updated as the updated weight. On a step six, we perform, we repeat the step two to five 
for all of the input signals. We will not have one or two data. We will have lots of data. We repeat for all of the data. And once done, we repeat from two to six. That means everything until the error reaches to the acceptable level. That means the maybe the error is 1%, then the accuracy will be 99%. When we can reach that or close to that, we say that the machine has or the neural network has learned and we stop that. So this repeating the process from starting to end, this is called an epoch. An epoch means repeating the state one to six. That means every time we train the network using entire data set for once, we call it one epoch. Okay, so this is what the Delta rule does. It's comparatively, I mean, it's easier but there is a bad news that is we don't use delta rule anymore. That is obsolete, but it is for the learning process. We use the generalized delta rules. So what is generalized delta rules? In the generalized delta rules, we use the sigmoid activation function. Why do we do that? Think about a value here. So it gives us the probability that what is the probability that it is a positive class. If we get a signal here, it again gives us a probability that tells us what is the probability that it is a negative class. So as the, the sigmoid function never touches one or never touches zero, it always maintains the range from zero to one. So it is a very good feed to predict the probability of a particular class. And that's why we use the sigmoid function in generalized delta rules. Things looks the same, that nothing different. The only thing changed here is this delta. It is not the delta we studied in the previous slide. This delta, is the first derivative of the sigmoid function. Then it takes the weighted sum as input and multiplies the error. If we do the first derivative, take the first derivative of the sigmoid function, we get this value and Instead of X, definitely we will use the input signal. That means the weighted sum. And when we do that, our final equation becomes this. And we update the weight as this. So we have the error the way we had before. We have the input signal the way we had before. We have the learning rate exactly like before. The only change here is in the delta, it is because we are using the generalized delta rule. So that's the only thing changes. So now we have learned one practical rule to train the network. Oh, all right. So this rule tells us that how to update the weight, how to generate the weight that we have to update, but how actually we have to update that. That is the topic of updating the weights. There are many different ways and we will focus on the simplest one at the beginning. That is called SGD stands for Stochastic Gradient Descent, SGD. What does it do? The SGD calculates the error of each of the training data. If we have 500 training data, SGD will adjust the weight for 500 times. That means it is the direct application, nothing serious. Then we're, why we're talking about it? We're talking about it to make us understand that there is something else waiting for us. That is called batch method. 
this is another way of updating the weights. Think about it. We have, say that we have 10,000 data. If we calculate the error for 10,000 data, update each of the weights for every error, then it will be very, very computationally expensive. Perhaps it will take a long time to train the network. So to reduce the compu computational complexity, another approach has been derived that is called BAT method. In this method, weights are adjusted only for once. In this method, all of the errors are calculated first. There is no difference here. Then we calculate the average error. And that average error is used to update the weights. That means we are doing everything all at once. We calculate all of the errors, calculate the average error here, and use this average error to update the weights all at once. It's not that we are updating every weight for every error. We have one average error. We are using that single value to update the weights. So it is much faster. After that, we have even a little better approach that is called mini batch method. This method says that, all right, we will use the batch method, but why don't we, if we have 100 data points, divide it into mini batches. For example, there will be 10 batches and 10 data set, 10 data segments in each batch. Then we will update the weights of those batches. That means it's not that we are updating all of the weights based on one single value, but we are updating the weights of the batch. We are updating the weights based on the error of the mini batch and we are we are considering the average weights of each of the batch that is much better approach it takes the concept of sgd and the batch method and merge together so it has the advantages of sgd and batch method so we can consider it as the combination of both sgd and batch method. So we have covered everything we need to know before being practical. That is, what is a node? How signal flows? How node processes signal? What is activation function? How the network learns? And how do we train the network? We know everything, so it is we are ready to delve into the practical session. So our practical session starts now, that is training the network. So in order to train the network, we need the network first. So this is our network architecture. We are going to train a single layer neural network. This is our dummy training data set. Again, we're not using any real world data. This is the learning session. Once you will have the basics and solid background foundation, then you can use your own data set and train sophisticated networks. We know that in supervised learning, the training data comes in, input and corresponding correct output. That means for this set of input, we are expecting zero output. For this set of input, we are expecting one as the output. So how it works, this zero goes through this input node, this zero goes through this input node, this zero goes through this input node. And it should generate zero here at the output. If it happens, then we will say that network learned properly. So how do we do that? Here, what I just drawn, here it is a further explanation of that. We don't need it. So let's be a little organized to write the code. We need a script for training. We need a script 
for sigmoid function, because this is our activation function, we need a script for training the network and we need a script for testing the network. For training, I have already prepared a script. The name is training underscore SGD. For sigmoid function, we have the sigmoid script. For training function, we have function under SGD. For testing script, we already have a script ready. So don't worry about this naming too much. We are going to write the code now. Everything will be crystal clear after that. So first things first, we are going to design the sigmoid function. In MATLAB, we use the function keyword to declare a function. And then we, decide, we take a variable to store the output. After that, we write the name of the function and the input or the argument the function will receive. That means the parameter name. After that, okay, let me clean the screen. It looks messy. All ink has been erased. All right. After that, it is the sigmoid function definition. We have already seen that. Sigmoid function is one over one plus e to the power minus six. So it is nothing but the same function. One divided by one plus exp. That is the exponential minus six. This is the MATLAB syntax of the code. And finally, we end the function. So our sigmoid function is ready. First script done. Now the second script, that is function underscore SGD. That means we are using stochastic gradient descent to train our network. At the very beginning, use the function keyword, then the variable where the weight will be stored, then the name of the function, and what this function will receive. This function receives the weight, the input, and the correct output. All right, after receiving the weight, input, and correct output, then we need to define the alpha. Alpha means the learning rate. We use 0 0.9, that means very high learning rate. After that, we are declaring n equals four. This is for iteration. It is just a variable and initiation of that variable. We are taking a for loop now. In MATLAB, we start the for loop with the for keyword, then k equals one ratio n. That means this for loop will run from one to n times. The input we are sending to the function, it is that input. And it will start at K and it will take all of the inputs. This K colon, K comma colon means everything will be taken. And we will transpose it to match the matrix dimension because we are going to do the multiplication. Finally, this transpose matrix will be stored in transposed input variable. After that, we have the correct output. We will store this correct output in a variable D. And the index is K. This K is coming from the for loop. I believe that you all understand how to do the indexing inside of the loop when we use for loop we use the uh, iterator here, the K, to, to, in, to, you, to use as the index of the value. Here, these are all matrices. So they have index and those index value are defined by the K. Then we're applying the formula. Weight multiplied with transposed input. 
and that is the weighted sum. The weighted sum is stored in the weighted sum matrix. After that, we take this weighted sum as the input argument of sigmoid function, a function we designed a few minutes ago. And that's the output. But that we are not done yet. We have the output. This is not the final output. This is predicted output. Then we have now we have to calculate the error. We know that we calculate the error from correct output minus our predicted output. This is the formula we learned. And we are applying that formula here to calculate the error. After that, we calculate the delta. It is not the, the, that delta we started at the beginning. This is the SGD's delta, which we studied later, and which is we are going to use. I already mentioned that we are going to skip the delta rule, but we'll use the generalized delta rule. So how did you write this code? For you to understand easily, I have already written the mathematical model here. Whatever we do in software engineering and computer science, everything is built on mathematics. We just take the mathematical ex expression and write it on the code. So plain application of mathematics and the code we are writing here is no difference. Application of this equation. All right, now we have to modify the weight. Modify the weight means we will multiply alpha, the delta we calculated here, and the transposed input. The transposed input is nothing but what we have generated in our previous slide. And finally, we will update the weight using this formula. This is updated weight. This is the previous weight. And this is the value we are adding or subtracting from the previous weight. This weight represents this part. And we have to do the same thing for the second weight because we have three input signal. So we have to do the same thing for three of the weights. Once done, that's the end. These weights are returned from the function. So our Function SGD is completed. So we have the sigmoid function. We have the function that uses the SGD method and use generalized delta rule to train the network. So we are good to go to start the training. To train the network, we need the input data. So these are the input data. And definitely we need the corresponding correct output. These are the corresponding correct output. That means for this set of input, we are expecting this output. For this set of input, we are expecting this output. For this set of inputs, we are expecting this output and this set of inputs should generate this output. So our data set is ready. After that, we need to randomly initialize the weight. Remember, we started in our delta rule that we have to randomly initialize the weight. This is that randomization. After that, it is time to start the training. Remember that we learned what is an epoch we use the variable name epoch here to, so that it makes sense. Epoch means repeating the entire process and train the network with all of the data we have. So one entire training means one epoch. Here we are using one to 10,000. So there will be 10,000 epoch. So the weights will be updated for 10,000 times. How we will update the weight? We have already prepared the function. So things will be pretty simple now. We will pass the weight, this weight, the initial weight. 
we will pass the input, this input, and we will pass the correct output. We already have it here, pass the correct output. And the function will take care of the rest. It will run for 10,000 times and the updated weight will be returned. Finally, end the for loop. So this updated weight is what we called the trained weight. That means the network will be trained. Once the network is trained, it is time to test the network. Moving on, how to test the network. To test the network, we need data. Without data, how we are going to test. So these are our testing data. Then we're initiating n equals to four because we have four data here. Then we're initiating a for loop. In order to match the matrix dimension, we need to transpose the testing data. If we don't trans transpose while doing the matrix multiplication, there will be dimension mismatching and the program won't be able to perform the matrix operation. That's where you were transposing it. So the transposed input will be stored in this variable. And finally, the weight will be multiplied with the transposed input. And that weighted sum will be the input of the sigmoid function and that gives us the final output. Remember, we process everything through activation function. This is the activation function. So this output will tell us, that will give us the probability of correct output. So this is the code. Now it is time to see everything in action. Please let me know if you can see the MATLAB coding environment and if you can see the code. You can type a response in the chat box if you can see the code. Okay, so the first things first, we designed the sigmoid function. Here is our sigmoid function. After that, we designed the SGD, stochastic gradient descent method and we used generalized delta rule to train the network and this is the code exactly what we typed on the slide after that this is the script to train the network so let's train the network i see that i have some pre previously done work here so we are clearing it all and clearing this one too okay please ignore and please accept my Apology if I type too fast. To clean everything, we use CLC. To clear all, we use clear all command. Okay, now let's train the network. So for training, we just simply need to run it. And the training is completed. Once the training is completed, then we can test. But before that, I want your Attention here, you see number of epoch, 10,000. Correct output was 00110. And this is the weight, the correct weight, the trained weight. Instead of focusing on there, let's do the test first. These are our testing data. Uh, this is just some dummy data. It is for learning purpose. In real world, we never train and test using the same data set. But here we did it to keep things simple because these are all dummy data set. Let's run it to test. All right, our first output 0 0.007. For 001 input, we should get zero and it is close to zero. So our network was trained properly. For 001, we should get zero. It is 0076, almost zero. We can consider it as zero. 
That means network learn properly. For 101, we need, we were expecting one output. We got 0 0.99, that is almost equals to one. And for what, triple one, we were expecting 0 0.99 output. That is also what we were expecting. So network could generate the expected result. That means it has been trained properly. And that's how we start working with single layer neural network. So before closing the session, I want to give you the insight of multi-layer neural network. Let's go back to our slide and have a slide view this time and have an overview. So in neural network, we have model instead of neural network. I mean, we have neural network instead of model and we use some learning rules. What are the learning rules now? We know that we used, I think you are muted. Can you answer? Can you uh, unmute yourself and answer? Okay, we used a generalized delta rule as learning rule. And these are the weighted sum we calculated. This is a multi-layer neural network. We didn't use that. We used a single layer neural network. <coughs> and I wanted to highlight on the learning process. We applied all of the mathematical equation in our training process and we wrote the code based on this mathematical approach. So whatever we do, whatever program we write under the hood, it's all some mathematical expression. We just code that. Now I want your attention in one particular scenario that is our network architecture. This is our network architecture. In this network, we calculated the error from where? We ca calculated the error from the output, from the output node. All of the errors were calculating from the output node and the weights are associated with output node. This error were used to update these weights. That's how our network learned to predict the right output, right? So we calculate the, calculated the error. We used that error to train the weight associated with this node. That's how our network learned. Now I will put you in a question. In a, in a complicated situation. And you have to think for a while that how to get rid of that complicated situation. That is, this multi-layer neural network. In this multi-layer neural network, these are the input layer and these are the output layer. And if we calculate the error, the way we have done before, that means these are the errors of output node only. We can update the weights associated with output node, output layer only. What about these hidden layers? Do we know the error of the hidden layers? No, we don't know the errors of the hidden layer. If we don't know the error of the hidden layers, then how can we train a multi-layer neural network? No matter how hard we try, no matter how many times we use this error, it will always correct 
only the weights associated with output layer. That means we can't access this hidden layer. This is one of the reason it is called hidden layer. And if we can't access them, there is no way we can train them. If we can't train them, then we can't design sophisticated network that can understand human language, that can recognize images, because single layer neural network is not that intelligent. So where is the challenge? The challenge is in the learning rule. The, the learning rule we used, generalized delta rule, that is only for single layer neural network. That won't work here. In order to train a multi-layer neural network, we need back propagation algorithm. So when we use back propagation algorithm as learning rule, then we can train multi-layer neural network. It can have hundreds of uh, hidden layers and it, we can train it to recognize human voice or to recognize images, to act like a smart robot, we can do, the sky is the limit. We can do whatever we want. So where do we need to bring the change? We need to bring the change in the learning rule. So what do we want to train? A deep neural network to predict lung cancer, a convolutional neural network to recognize images, a very large deep neural network to process big data. You come up with anything, natural language, language processing, that is NLP. You just use the appropriate learning rule, design the network and it will work. So we have developed our foundation. The heart, well, what is the core? What is the engine here? The engine is the learning rule. We learned generalized delta rule that is for single layer neural network but in one session it is not possible to cover back propagation and other sophisticated learning rule perhaps in future we'll sit again to see how to train a multi-layer neural network but that's all for today thank you very much for having me on this international lecture program i'm really happy and grateful to be here now the platform is open for the students and the learners. You can ask questions. I will try my best to respond. Okay. Hello. I can hear you. Okay. Hi, sir. Good afternoon. My name is Rajeshwari. I'm a student of Stagum University. So I have some questions regarding to your presentation. The first one about bias. So how exactly that we define that bias? Sometimes we, I see that someone will define bias as one then in order to prevent that model got finished we will define bias as zero so what is the parameter for bias all right it's a very good question yeah so we kept the bias one mm -hmm. for the sake of simplicity okay. now your question is when to use one when to use zero what yeah. to do with bias so mm -hmm. think about from a very regular perspective, generalized perspective. What is bias? For example, in a classroom, the student who performs very well, the teachers are biased to them. Am I right? Yeah. They think that, no, whatever they're doing, that is right. Yeah. That means if that student is a node, mm -hmm. the bias value to that node is very high. Maybe one so the emphasis on that node is higher than other nodes okay. so we use the bias value to define the emphasis on mm -hmm. that node. if we use zero there mm -hmm. that means we are not emphasizing on that node we are not pre-emphasizing on that node the signal and weight controls everything so bias mm -hmm. is a control factor okay. if you use one that means it will have maximum impact if you use zero it will have no pre-impact and that's mm -hmm. the range zero to one now you decide what type of impact you want to have from that note okay got it so then about learning rules 
uh, as per your example, you div- um, your output it belongs to zero or one. Then why don't you use rel? Why you use sigmoid function? All right, the sigmoid yeah. function. Very good question. Yeah, we use the sigmoid function because we want to keep the probability okay. in between zero and one. Mm-hmm. If you observe the sigmoid function, mm-hmm. it is asymptotic. It never yeah. cross one. Yeah. It never go below zero. It is probability distribution. Yeah. Yes, probability yeah. distribution. Yeah. And we want probabilistic result. We just okay. want to predict that one or zero, then it will be hard threshold. When okay. we use hard threshold, mm-hmm. then you understand not that intelligent approach, either zero or one. We are okay. not considering the proximity. If it is hard threshold, oh. it is here, we are saying it's no. If it is here, mm-hmm. we're saying it's yes. But when we use the sigmoid function, mm-hmm. it gives us the probabilistic result. It mm-hmm. more, makes it more uh, reliable and accurate. That's why we used sigmoid function. Okay, okay, got it. And then the next one, may I still ask question? Sure, no problem. We okay, okay. about epochs. So how we set the number of epoch? Is that mean that if we set the larger number of epoch, it means it will increase that accuracy? Because sometimes I will see that, I see that uh, someone will set the epoch as 500 or 1,000 or 100. So how actually that parameter we should define? That is- okay, yeah. very good question. <laughs> so in order to answer this, answer this question, mm. I will take help of the whiteboard. Uh, okay. But I can't access the whiteboard of the Zoom. That's why I'm going to share the screen for once again. Mm. And please let me know if you can see that paint tool. Yeah, yeah, it is. Okay. So uh, normally, if we uh, if we want to train the machine learning algorithm as a black box without knowing what we're doing, in mm-hmm. that case, you will find that uh, many people just set the epoch randomly without yeah. knowing what is happening. Mm -hmm. So what we do, we use the learning curve. So this is the error, Mm -hmm. and this is the number of epoch. Mm -hmm. At the beginning, definitely the error will be very high, maybe close to 100%. The more the number of epoch, eventually the error starts falling. Now, your question is, how many epoch should we use? You will see that after a certain period of time, the error will not reduce anymore. So if you keep going on and on and on, that means, say here is 10, here is 20, here is 50, here is 100. So after 100 epoch, the machine has learned as much as it could learn. After that, it is not learning anymore. So don't increase the epoch, just to stop here. Later, it doesn't matter how many times you're repeating, you are just wasting your resources. So how do we adjust? How do we define that? What should be the number of epoch? Mm -hmm. At the beginning, we don't know. So we set a very large number, maybe um, 10,000 we used, Mm -hmm. but we set it dynamically. Once the learning curve no longer changes, In that case, we stop right there. And that's the number of epoch we should use. So it's dynamic. Okay. 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 Got it. Okay. Uh, One more. No problem, (laughs) please. Okay. About mini batches. You said uh, about mini batches. So mini batches, uh, it will reduce the complexity of computational. So Still, we should use a dropout if we choose mini batches instead of any algorithm. Uh, I uh, didn't understand the question properly. Would you please repeat that? Okay. Uh, you mentioned about, you explained about mini batches, right? So, mini batches, it will reduce the complexity of computational. So, if we use that uh, mini batches instead of any others, should we apply dropout in our model? So your question is, uh, I mentioned that when we use mini bats to reduce the computational complexity. Yeah. And you are trying to- Actually, 
drop drop out drop drop out is will reduce the dimensional of the model or of our data. So still we should use uh, drop out if we choose to use uh, mini batches. That is. Okay, so uh, let me clear it. Okay. So we use the dropout. Mm -hmm. This dropout means we are dropping out the few of the impacts of the node. The okay. machine is being the general machine is being overfit. When mm -hmm. the when we understand the network is being overfit, that mm -hmm. means each of the nodes are learning properly. That means it will be able to predict only from mm -hmm. the training data set. In that case we use the concept of dropout. Let's drop out a few of the nodes mm -hmm. so that the machine, so that the neural network generalizes. So the mini batch method is used. It is also used to ensure the generalization. Yes, we can use the dropout uh, mm -hmm. or generalization. We can also mm -hmm. combine both of the mini batches and dropout. There is no oh, harm okay. in it. Okay. And, and okay. that's actually the, I mean, beauty of, uh, machine learning. Okay, I, no... okay. All right. I thought it will give some impact to our model, so I got confused. Yeah. Okay, uh, sir, uh, one more, but I think it's not related to your presentation. If someone uh, more interested about deep learning, as we know that deep learning is a subset of machine learning, but it is a quite different algorithm is used. So should we learn about machine learning first, then dive in into uh, deep learning, or we can directly dive into deep learning. All right. So, so I understand. Is your yeah. All right. I understand. You want the, I mean, the guidance to learn neural network properly, deep mm. learning properly. Mm. So it is all branch of artificial intelligence. From artificial intelligence, mm. what do we learn in AI? We learn mm. search algorithm, mm. knowledge representation, uncertainty. Then we learn to optimize these things. After that comes the machine learning. Yeah. From machine learning, here comes the neural network. Yeah. From neural network, when we add more hidden layers, then come the deep learning. Mm. And when we add uh, some feature extractor and convolutional layer together, then it becomes the convolutional neural network. So mm. it's the sequence. It should start okay. from artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. then machine learning, then neural network, then deep neural network, then convolutional neural network, and we should follow this sequence. Okay, so, okay. Okay, thank you for your answering, sir, and suggestions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mapita, for the opportunity. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for this you know, very insightful questions. I think that through these questions, we have learned a lot. Thank you for your answering, Ms. Nuru Zaman. Yeah, I think we don't have no more questions again from our students. Can we uh, go to session crossing? I had a little, a little network glitch, so do you please repeat the last part? I couldn't hear it properly. Yeah, I think we don't have no more questions from our students, and we will continue with closing session. Yeah, is it okay? Yes, it's okay. We can proceed to the closing session. Yeah, thank you for Mr. Nuruzaman Faruqi for sharing your knowledge with us. It's so very beneficial for our audience. Yeah, thank you for joining in. Yeah, thank you for teaching in our class in the University. I hope we can meet again in other event with our offline class or online also, maybe. Yeah, thank you for Mr. Nuruzaman for joining today. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, goodbye. Thank you for having me. Bye. Thank you so much. <laughs>